Connect your headphones. You're listening to Nick's Moon Reads. Hey, uh, I just wanted to let you know that apparently 60% of the people that watch my videos aren't even subscribed. So if you're in that 60%, could you hit that subscribe button for me, please? It would really mean a lot to me. It's free, and you can always change your mind later. I'm just trying to get to 100k. And if you don't, then um, I'm going to break into your car, and I'm going to pre-chew some of your gum and then put it back as if nothing happened. The only way for you to find out which one's pre-chewed you're going to need to figure that out. <laughs> Enjoy. Warning, this audio will contain some depictions of graphic and disturbing events from the FNAF floor. As a form of precaution, there will be an on-screen timer to let you know when the graphic audio is about to begin. Viewer discretion is advised. He's coming. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the movie's gonna be so cool! I just know it! Oh my goodness! The animatronics look so good! They look just like how they look in the game! I know, right? The music sounds fantastic as well! I just... And we're gonna be seeing it tonight! Oh my gosh, I'm so excited! Although, it doesn't look like they're gonna be entirely true to the FNAF lore, at least from the looks of it. But I could be wrong. I mean... All the trailers that they've released for the movie have pretty much shown the exact same thing. They've very rarely shown new scenes, and if they show a new scene, it's just an extended version of a scene we've already seen. <laughs> scene. Yeah. But I'm still excited. I really cannot wait to see what they do with it. And Scott Cawthon was with the entire production, so if the man himself who made it is watching the movie and says it's going to be good, it's going to be good. Yeah, the, the, the lore for FNAF is pretty complicated when you think about it, but once you understand it, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I'm sorry. What? You don't understand it? You're joking, right? You're joking, right? Darling, listen to me. If we're going to watch this movie, you're going to need to know the lore. Lucky for you, I got all the information you need. Now, believe it or not, there are some parts even I still don't understand. I know, I know. Shocker, your boyfriend who's been obsessed with FNAF since the day it came out doesn't know everything about it. But I'll explain everything I do know about it to you. And I'll try my best to make it as simple as possible. Now, do keep in mind, though, most of the stuff I got from MatPat. I'll leave a link in the description to his videos. Oh, sorry. F fourth wall break. All right. Okay, now. Listen up and pay attention. You ready? Okie dokie. Let's begin. It begins with a man named William Afton, who lives in a small town with his family. His family consists of his wife and three kids. His wife's name has never been revealed, and people have called her Clara mainly because in sister location, Valora is created in honor of his wife, and since Valora sounds like Clara, the fandom refers to her as that. I like to refer to her as Mrs. Afton, but we'll call her Clara in this case. Now his children are Michael Afton, the oldest son, Elizabeth Afton, the middle child, who is also the daughter, and the crying child, the youngest. Now, the crying child's name also hasn't been officially revealed, but... There's this FNAF logbook, and there's a Foxy Grid, and when it was solved, it spelled the name Evan. So everyone speculates that the crying child's name is Evan Afton, so we'll be rolling with that. And also because the person voicing me is named Evan. Wait, what? Sorry, sorry, broke the fourth wall there again. My bad. <clears throat> Anyways. William is running this restaurant named Fred Bears, which is based off of a roadside attraction called Fred Bears Singin' Show a show which dates all the way back to the Great Depression. This show featured a trained bear performing for an audience like one of those circus bears that you would see at the circus. Now, it's not known when William first saw this attraction, and I highly doubt that he saw it during the Great Depression, because if he did, he would be close to his 30s by the time we get to the timeline of the main story. So, it's assumed that he either saw it as a kid, 
way after the Great Depression, or it was passed down from generations and like his previous ancestors and his like, it's like a family business, you know? But in this case, we're gonna go with him having seen it as a kid and sometime after the Great Depression who saw this and wanted to one day bring it to life for a bigger audience. So, with the skills of making mascots and his heavy inspiration from Walt Disney, he was beginning to bring that childhood dream to life. He would go on to create Fred Bears, but he felt that one character just wasn't enough. So, he created another one. A yellow rabbit with a purple vest and tie named Bonnie the Bunny, or Spring Bonnie. Well, yeah, 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 he is also Springtrap, but we're not at that point in the story just yet, so we'll get there further down the line. Now, keep in mind that this mascot that he created was entirely his own original creation. He had no inspiration from like a previous character that he saw. He created this character entirely and quite literally from scratch. Now, before he fell into his crazed Frankenstein serial killer phase, William actually had good intentions. He wanted to bring this to life. He wanted to bring things to life all from the very beginning and he was doing great. That is, until things began to change around him. Other businesses saw the success of his business and they wanted a piece of that pie. This is where we will then discover Chica's Party World, William's first rival restaurant. And this restaurant also featured animal characters performing on stage. It was his idea, but a lot better. And why, you may ask? Well, it's very simple. They had robotic animatronics that were able to roam around the restaurant and interact with the guests with no human control. William was impressed. It hurt his pride, but he was amazed. And he would then discover that the genius behind these amazing creations was a man by the name of Henry Emily. Now this new restaurant featured new characters, and the first one we obviously all know and love is Chica the Chicken, as well as a pig, a frog, and a bear as the main stage attraction. And off to the side we have two other characters, one of them an elephant magician, and another one which is a hippo that never ever ever stops talking. William was amazed. He was so fascinated with the way Henry was able to bring these characters to life with his abilities. It, it shocked him to his very core. But along with this fascination came jealousy. And that jealousy would then turn into pure hardened bitterness as he watched families choose Chica's Party World over Fred Bears, hosting birthday parties at Chica's Party World instead of Fred Bears. Because of this competition stealing away all of his customers, he had to file for bankruptcy. And just when he thought that it was all over for his business, it was bought out of bankruptcy. Bought out by none other than Henry. Normally, people would see this as a second chance. Your business has just been saved and new opportunities are soon to reveal themselves with the second chance that you've been given by this kind individual who bought you out of bankruptcy. But not for William. Oh, no, no, not William. This was an embarrassment to him, an action that left him severely humiliated, bought out by his own rival that stole his idea, a form of humiliation that would stay with William for many, many years to come. Now, after Henry bought out Fred Bears, the companies merged together and opened a new restaurant called Fred Bears Family Diner. With Henry's robotics and William's ideas combined, it was a perfect match, using onstage animatronics and actors in suits to interact with the guests. Now, they stuck with Fred Bear since he was easily recognizable, and characters from the mediocre melodies would perform alongside Fred Bear and Bonnie, even landing some official merch. Now, the reception for some characters weren't exactly the best, so those that had negative reception would be left behind, while the other characters with positive reception would be favored. With this attraction and all of this stuff combined, business goes kablooey. Their restaurant is so successful that they're able to have just Fredbear and Bonnie support the restaurant on their own. Sorry, getting a little excited. They were also able to save up enough money to be able to launch another restaurant for the other characters that they had to leave behind. And it's the restaurant we all know and love, 
Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. And everyone knows who the cast of characters are. Chica the Chicken, Bonnie the Blue Bunny, Foxy the Pirate, and of course, Freddy Fazbear. Not only were they able to create another restaurant, but they were also able to launch their own cartoon show called Fredbear and Friends. Business was exploding off the charts, and it didn't seem to be stopping or slowing down whatsoever. However, William was a bit upset with the cartoon because his own creation, his only creation, Bonnie the Bunny, or Spring Bonnie, was completely absent. The one animatronic that was his own original creation was excluded from the show. But despite that, everything else was fine. He had himself a wife, two sons, a daughter, a constantly growing business, and was able to learn robotics from Henry, something he soon falls in love with. Now, when a new character was introduced to the franchise, there was a process that they had to follow. First, William would hand sew a suit with five fingers for any actor to wear so that they could go around the pizzeria and interact with the guests. This was the quickest and easiest way. And then, not long after that character was introduced, Henry would then create an animatronic version of that character with either a hinged or sliding jaw mouth. These would be the first versions of animatronics. But William didn't want to stop there. He had a much bigger picture in mind. He didn't want the animatronics to be bound to the stage. He wanted them to actually interact with the guests the way a mascot would. And with Henry's skills, he was on his way to becoming a robotics genius. However, he was also hoping to one day beat Henry, to be able to prove to everyone that he was much smarter than him. Unfortunately though, William would let that goal and his pride get to his head, and it would be what would inevitably lead to his downfall. And with that said downfall, tragedy wasn't far behind. William and Henry would design this new type of suit called the Springlock Suit, a hybrid suit that would work both as a human costume designed by William and an animatronic suit designed by Henry. This suit was designed to keep the animatronic parts in place so that a mascot could safely wear the suit. But it was still in beta testing with a few kinks to work out, meaning that the release was very limited and the prototypes were kept in Fred Bear's family diner only. Now, with all of this on the table, William was a very, very, very busy man. And as mentioned before, he's a father of three kids and he had no time to be a full-time parent. So he installed some nanny cams to keep an eye on his kids and to also keep an eye on his youngest son, Evan, he installed a nanny cam within his favorite toy, which was a plushy Fredbear. He also left babysitting duties to Evan's brother, Michael, but Michael was probably the worst babysitter of all time. Now, we're gonna shift our focus to these two. Evan is terrified of the animatronics, and Michael took advantage of this. He would scare him with a foxy mask and leave him crying on the floor. And then, Michael saw an opportunity to pull the ultimate prank on him. One that you would see in a cringy YouTube channel. And he had the nerve to do this prank on Evan's birthday. Michael and his friends took Evan and forced him to do what he had been so afraid of doing. Getting close to the animatronics. Evan didn't want to. He cried and pleaded for them to put him down. But his pleas fell on deaf ears. No one tried to help him. Kids will be kids. They continued to torment him as they drew closer and closer to Fredbear. He was crying and crying, begging for it all to stop. Then they reached Fredbear and they got him closer and closer to the animatronic. They pushed him into the jaws of the animatronic. Evan kicked and screamed and cried and wailed, trying to get free, while Michael and his friends were all laughing hysterically, enjoying the torment that they had just forced onto Evan. But then, that laughter would soon cease. The animatronic's jaw snapped shut firmly. The spring locks were triggered by Evan's tears and movement which caused it to close down on his head, crushing his frontal lobe and making him go limp. Michael and his friends stopped. Michael looked at what he had just done. He... he couldn't believe it. It was... it was just a prank. It wasn't... it wasn't supposed to be harmful. It was just a joke, right? Evan would be rushed to the hospital and put on an IV. He would be given flowers and pills in hopes that he would be able to recover from this. 
Sadly, the damage had already been done, and it was far too much. Evan's consciousness began to fade away, and in his final moments, he could hear his brother's last words to him. Can you hear me? I, I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> I'm sorry. He would then hear his father's voice, saying that he was broken, but that he was still his friend. And he promised him that he would be able to be put back together, that he would put him back together. Evan's heart soon flatlined. He died by the hands of his own brother. His body would be buried in a remote location that was alongside the path William would take to and from work. And every time he would go to work and leave work, he would always stop by the grave to pay him a visit and pay his respects. Changes would be made in the wake of the tragedy. Children now had to wear wristbands so they wouldn't wander too far away from the pizzeria. And if they did, they would be stopped by the puppet or marionette. Yeah, yeah, the one that was uh, <clears throat> in Five Nights at Freddy's 2. The one that you gotta wind the music box to prevent you from to prevent it from attacking you, and you can't beat it with the good old Freddy mask. Anyways, it would prevent them from going to places without permission, and it would also protect the children from any potential danger. Henry had this gut feeling about William, though. William had just lost his son, and not just that, but by the hands of his other son. He could tell that William was a ticking time bomb, and he was on his last few minutes. The Springlock animatronics were retired, locked away to collect dust in Freddy Fazbear's pizza. A major, major blow that William had to swallow. But it wasn't just him who was going through grief. The entire Afton family was broken. His wife was so miserable, just sitting on the couch watching TV. It was all that she could do. But Michael, he was in complete misery. He was riddled with the overwhelming guilt of him being responsible for his brother's death hearing the words, it's me, over and over and over again, and seeing hallucinations of Fredbear in his hallways, in his room, in his closet, towering over him in his bed. He was convinced that he was being haunted by his brother. And William? William. Oh, poor William. He would sink further into his work and his drinking. A local bar named Junior's became a second home for him and given how his son's body was buried not too far away from it as well. He would go to obviously drink and to think, reminisce on the past, and think that maybe if I had done this or done this, Evan would still be alive and he wouldn't have to go out of his way to put him back together. But he also took the time to stew on what had been done to him. Henry, stealing his ideas, his own original creation, being excluded from the cartoon about their creations, and how he was heavily embarrassed when he was bought out of bankruptcy by Henry. It was all just deplorable. And now his son, his son was gone. And it was all because of Henry. It was his robotic creation that failed. It was his springlock creation that killed his son. He would order one more drink, but he was kicked out. In a drunken state, William drove back to the restaurant. He was ready to give Henry a piece of his mind, maybe even start a fight. He was going to show Henry just how much pain his actions had caused him and his family. But then he discovers a little girl stuck outside the pizzeria. It was Charlie, Henry's daughter. She was locked out of the pizzeria, and bullies on the inside were laughing at her. Great. Another problem to deal with. At first, that was when William's sinister mind took over his body. This was his chance. Oh my goodness, this was his chance to finally get back at the man who took his son from him. If William can't have his son, then why should Henry have his daughter? Why should Henry be able to keep his daughter while William has to deal with the fact that his son is dead? He hated these odds. He wanted to get even with Henry. That's exactly why he was going to the pizzeria in the first place, right? And the opportunity just presented itself on a silver platter for him. So he attacked Charlie. It's 
not clear how he did it, but given that he didn't have much of a weapon with him, I'm going to assume that he strangled her. He grabbed her firmly by the throat and started squeezing as tightly as he could. She kicked and squirmed, trying to get free. She tried to fight back, but her body was just too weak, and William in his drunken state was as stronger than he had ever been. He kept squeezing as he felt her life drain from her body. She had tears streaming down her face. She was trying so hard, and all she could think about was trying to get to her dad. She tried to scream out for dad, but she couldn't even get a peep out because her vocal cords were being crushed by this monster's hands. Slowly, her life drained away, and her body went limp. William stepped back, and he realized what he had just done, and he felt pure bliss. Finally, all that anger and rage built up was finally let out. The years of resentment released in a fury of pure rage. He knew this would hurt Henry beyond repair, and that is exactly what he wanted. He left her body to rot in the rain, where it would then be discovered by the puppet. Charlie's death was ruled as a random act of violence. Henry was at first suspicious of William, but there was no evidence linked to him. This is why I believe that William killed Charlie by strangling her. The rain would have washed away his fingerprints. The two deaths of Charlie Emily and Evan Afton damaged Fredbear's reputation, and it would later close down, while Freddy Fazbear's Pizza would continue business as normal. All the original equipment from Fredbear's would be locked away at Freddy's and would remain untouched for two years. William had to keep a low profile, so he buried himself in his work more and more, and then eventually surpassed Henry in his genius. He would create his own company known as Afton Robotics, where he would run experiments. Experiments to bring his son back to life. The promise he had made to put him back together. The promise that he had made to his son while he lay on his deathbed. While also down there, he would monitor his kids on the cameras with a passcode 1983. The year of Evan's death, a reminder of why he was down there, the reminder of the promise he made to him while he lay on his deathbed. But the thing is, cameras just weren't enough when it came to Michael. He had to ensure that Michael never repeated the same mistake again. So, he decided to run a little experiment on him. Now, this is where my theory that I came up with comes into play. It was confirmed by Scott that Five Nights at Freddy's 4 is mainly caused by a gas that William released onto the player, and he used still endoskeleton statues as the placement for the nightmares. This leads me to believe that it's Michael who we are playing as in the game. It would all make sense. Why else would William be putting him through this torment? He was the one that killed his son after all, and he was going to make him sorry. All of this meant that William's home life suffered tremendously. His wife was suffering alone without her husband. She demanded that he be present more and more, but he refused every single time till she just decided to leave. And through all of this, something within William was set free. The murder of Charlie unleashed a form of freedom for him, and he wanted more of it. In 1985, he got dressed in the spring bonnie suit and would lure kids one by one into the back room of the pizzeria and slaughter them, luring them in with promises of treats or that their dog died or that he needed help with his homework. But where would he hide the bodies? He couldn't sneak out. Someone would see him carrying the bodies. So he decided to hide them in the animatronics, stuffing them into the suits. No one maintains them except him, so no one would ever know. Susie would go into Chica, and then three more kids would fall victim to him. Fritz, Jeremy, and Gabriel. They were too easy to kill. Oh, so easy. But the last one, the last one was way too far. He lost control of himself, and he let himself get too violent. Cassidy's body was so bloody and disfigured, and it looked absolutely awful. She looked completely unrecognizable. The only way that you would properly be able to identify her would be via her dental records. That one, that one he actually regretted killing. He, he definitely shouldn't have killed her. Chica, Freddy, Foxy, and Bonnie, they all had bodies stuffed into them. There was only one more place that could fit one more body, and that was the Fredbear suit. Cassidy's body would go into the Fredbear suit, locked away for no one else to find except William. 
This incident would make its way to the newspaper. Police would then charge William with the crimes, but he was able to walk away a free man because, once again, there was no evidence to prove against him. He was way too clever. But Henry? Henry knew the truth. So he kicked out William and shut the doors to Fazbear Entertainment. He was determined to ensure that this never, ever happened again. So he designed new animatronics with its own security system. These would be known as the toy animatronics. Yep, the one from the second game. And the opening of this restaurant found its way onto the newspaper, and that same article would be on the cover of the newspaper William just so happened to be reading. Freddy's? His idea was back? Henry once again had cut him out of the picture. He would not let this stand. He would not let him get away with this. But then he saw the phone number on the article to apply for the job that was listed on the article, a security guard. So William does what he does best. He came back. He would return to Freddy's not as an owner or a co-founder, but as a day shift security guard. Once he had the opportunity, he made his way to the back of the pizzeria. There they were, the original animatronics, Foxy, Bonnie, Chica, and Freddy, all withered away. Chica missing her arms, her jaw completely destroyed, Foxy still looking the same, Freddy looking a bit beaten up, and Bonnie missing an arm and his face. Old, withered away, and left to rot. But among them, there it was, the golden bunny suit. It was time. William always comes back. In 1987, five more kids were killed. Same way. This time, William didn't even try to hide the bodies. He just left them out in the daylight. This would completely cripple Henry's chances of keeping the pizzeria open. And not even a week after it was open, it had to be closed down. But William's curiosity started to grow as he saw that the withered animatronics were still walking around despite being retired. It was as if life was given to them. The next day, the news would report that a security guard was bitten by one of the animatronics. Was that... was that meant to be for him? Was... was that the bite of 87? Sorry, 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 sorry. I... I got... I got a little distracted. Sorry. Couldn't help it. Back on track. <clears throat> Now, at this point, Freddy's has so much of a bad reputation that it would most likely never, ever reopen again. So, William had to create something new. And thus, Circus Baby's Pizza World was born. This was his own pizzeria with his own creations. Freddy, Bonnie, and Foxy. Now, Chica isn't present in sister location. Why? Because Chica is not William Afton's creation. She is Henry Emily's creation. He was the one that created Chica's party world, and he was the one that created Chica. So after he disassociated himself from Freddy's, he took Chica with him and brought her back to her original franchise. It would make perfect sense as to why she's not present in the game. Now, there are two new creations that were added. First one being Ballora, as mentioned, was based off of his wife. And the other one was Circus Baby. This one he created with his daughter in mind. Baby was created for his daughter, Elizabeth Afton, the one who always listened to him. But one day, she disobeyed him, and that would be met with drastic consequences. Now, William had to come up with a way to continue his killings remotely, as he couldn't be seen on the public floor due to the reputation he's been carrying. So he designed a mechanism for his animatronics to be able to grab children and store them within the animatronics without his control. And this would unfortunately come back to haunt him. The day before Circus Baby's Pizza World was scheduled to open, Elizabeth got a bit too close to Circus Baby and then... Well, she ends up getting grabbed and folded like a lawn chair. Because of this incident, the restaurant closed down due to a gas leak, quote unquote. Then William noticed something about Baby. Her eye color was different. He built her with blue eyes, that he was sure of, but now they're green. Elizabeth's eye color. He got an idea. He realized that this could be the reason those old animatronics were wandering around in the first place. The remnants of the children that were stuffed in them 
were still within the animatronics, and he had to get to the bottom of this. He had to return to Freddy's. He entered the pizzeria, and he could see the condition that the place was in. Old, withered away, and left to rot. The animatronics still on the stage all this time. But not for long, though. One by one, William would lure the animatronics to a room not built within their programming, just like he would lure the kids to the back room to kill them. He would disassemble them like Legos. However, when he does this, he ends up freeing the souls of the children he murdered two years ago. They all came back, and they wanted revenge. Blocking the only way out for him, Cassidy's ghost approached him, and he panicked. And then he noticed the golden bonnie suit, the one he had used to lure them to the back and kill them. He got another idea. He hopped into the suit as quickly as possible, putting it on. It fit perfectly, just like old times. He looked at the ghosts and realized that his power was back. They couldn't do anything. He was the one in charge. He laughed in amusement. They all had came back to haunt him, but inevitably, he turned the tables on them. And now, what could they do? He had the key to life itself. It was as if he was a god. He laughed and <laughs> laughed, pointing in hilarity at how they couldn't do anything. He was unstoppable. There was nothing that could stop him now. As quickly as William began to laugh, he began to scream. The spring locks came undone, and they snapped back into place. All he could feel was excruciating pain as the spring locks tore through his body, his muscles, tendons, and nerves, and bones being torn to shreds. The pain was unbearable and beyond anything he could imagine. He tried to scream, but then he couldn't. The spring locks had torn through his vocal cords. Nothing could come out. Blood began to leak out of the suit as he collapsed onto the floor, twitching and shaking. His lungs filled with his own blood. The spring locks had already snapped shut, and yet he was still alive. They dug deeper into his stomach, and then they were all clamped into place. The room would be sealed off, and William would lay there in his own pool of blood for 30 years. Shifting back to Michael, he waited for his father to return, but he didn't. Now, William gave Michael specific instructions that if he were to never return, that he was to go into his office and to look behind some shelves in the corner of his office. That would be when Michael would discover his father's real office. All of this was being worked on by his father. He discovered everything, realizing that all the rumors about his father were true. He discovered the animatronics, baby caught his eye. She seemed familiar. Michael realized why. It was his sister. He found the blueprints on the animatronics, discovering their true purpose. Catching kids and trapping them in the animatronics? Everything around him, it all began to make sense. And he had one goal in mind now. Michael had to rescue them. The remnants were trapped within the animatronics. He had to free them so he follows his job to free the souls. He gets through the first four nights well, then two technicians are sent to scoop the animatronics of their endoskeletons. This scooping machine was used to, well, scoop ice cream. The animatronics are scooped and their endoskeletons are removed from their bodies, but they end up combining themselves to create an abomination named Ennard. So on night five, Michael follows Circus Baby's directions, hoping that this night would be the night he rescues the remnants until he finds himself in the scooping room. And Baby, Baby reveals that her true intentions were to have Michael's organs be scooped out so Ennard could crawl in and vibe in there. Like a twisted kangaroo, he tried to get out, but then he felt wires grab his arms and hoist him up, forcing him into a position perfectly aligned with the scooper. He tried to plead to get out, and then the scooper lunged at him, piercing through his stomach, excruciating pain shooting through his body as his organs were scooped out of his body. With Ennard now in Michael's body, his body began to deteriorate, mainly because he's a literal walking corpse. And then Ennard escapes Michael's body by puking him out. And then Michael gets up, and he has only one goal in mind now, to find William Afton 
to do this, he would apply for a job at every single pizzeria related to the murders of the children and search for clues of his whereabouts. He would change his name every time so he wouldn't be tracked down. And at the end of the week, he would then set the location on fire. Remnants aren't able to survive high temperatures. It was a guaranteed way of putting them to rest. And then he discovered this new attraction called Fazbear Frights that was turning his trauma into a horror attraction. He was livid. But he knew that if they were making a horror attraction about this, then they would for sure have something about him. About his father. He applied for the job, and he immediately got it. He would go there week after week in hopes of discovering anything about his father. But he found nothing. Until one day he got the call that he had been waiting weeks for. He was told they had finally found something. He flipped open the cameras, and there he was, his father. And despite his decayed condition, he was there. And as he fought through the week, he felt something. He felt a form of sensation, a release of something, as if the building released a tension on itself. It was like lost souls finally being able to rest and be set free from this torture. With that, Michael set the building on fire, finally putting an end to this journey. Except, it wasn't quite the end. William, despite his injuries, survived. He always comes back. He sustained a lot of damage, but he still survived. Michael thought that there was no hope. There was no stopping his father. If he was able to survive a blaze like that, then he could never track him down again. All of the connections leading to Freddy Fazbear's pizza were all gone and burnt to a crisp. How could he find his father? However, he then found something. Another application for Fazbear Entertainment? How? How was this possible? William was in the suit for decades. Mike knew right away that this wasn't meant to be a restaurant. It was a trap. But despite this, he still applied. Henry was doing this all to finally shut down everything once and for all, to put an end to the story for everyone. Henry creates an animatronic named Lefty, his last animatronic, with the sole goal in mind of capturing the remnant of his daughter. Then, Michael collects each and every single animatronic, bringing them to the restaurant, and on the final night, Henry would address them. Connection terminated. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Elizabeth, if you still even remember that name, but I'm afraid you've been misinformed. You're not here to receive a gift, nor have you been called here by the individual you assume. Although you have indeed been called, you have all been called here into a labyrinth of sounds and smells, misdirection and misfortune. A labyrinth with no exit, a maze with no prize. You don't even realize that you're trapped. Your lust for blood has driven you in endless circles, chasing the cries of children in some unseen chamber always seeming so near, yet somehow out of reach. But you will never find them. None of you will. This is where your story ends. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you, although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. I am remaining as well. I am nearby. This place will not be remembered, and the memory of everything that started this can finally begin to fade away, as the agony of every tragedy should. And to you monsters trapped in the corridors, be still and give up your spirits. They don't belong to you. For most of you, I believe there is peace and perhaps warm waiting for you after the smoke clears. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of the underworld has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, old friend. My daughter, if you can hear me, I knew you would return as well. It's in your nature to protect the innocent. I'm sorry that on that day, the day you were shut out and left to die, no one was there to lift you up into their arms the way you lifted others into yours. And then, what became of you? I should have known you wouldn't be content to disappear, not my daughter. I couldn't save you then, so let me save you now. It's time to rest, for you 
and for those you have carried in your arms. This ends for all of us. End communication. And that is where the story ends. Michael had achieved his plan, Henry had completed his plan, all of the souls were put to rest, William was sent to the underworld where he belongs to be tortured eternally for his crimes. Everyone's story came to an end in that pizzeria. Then another game came out making the entire speech pointless. But we aren't gonna get into that since everyone agrees that the canon ending was Henry's speech. So, we'll end it there. So, you think you're ready for the movie? Good! Oh, thank you so much for letting me tell you all about this. I'm so excited, thank you so much. I cannot wait for the movie. <gasps> oh my gosh, oh no. The movie's starting in less than an hour. I gotta get my cosplay ready. We better hurry. Come on, come on, let's go!